Warning, in this video we will be delving into the lore of Dead Space and Dead Space 3, which will contain heavy spoilers to the story of the third installment in the Dead Space franchise. I recommend you play Dead Space 3 before viewing this video. To those of you that wish to continue watching, let us delve into the complete history and timeline of Tau Volantis. Before the meddling of the Marker's influence, Tal Volantis was presumed to be an aquatic planet with vast oceans that would cover most of the surface of the planet. Underneath the oceans would lie caverns that would stretch on for miles, along with many of the cities that were constructed by the native aliens. The atmosphere is completely breathable to humans, even without plant life. This is because of the atmospheric oxygen due to the natural VUV light coming in from the sun that would bombard the planet at a constant pace during the night and day cycles. The carbon dioxide would react to the light and would break apart, turning back into the component gases that had created it, carbon monoxide and oxygen. Another explanation would be for bacteria known as cyanobacteria, who are photosynthetic, which can create oxygen in the process of photosynthesis, which this bacteria is fully capable of surviving in harsh environments such as cold Arctic weather conditions. Tau is the 19th letter of the Greek alphabet and symbolizes life and resurrection. Volantis is a genitive term derived from volant, meaning fly or move swiftly. Together, Tau Volantis could mean swift resurrection, a reference to the nature of the necromorphs. The name might also be a play on Atlantis, referencing the mythical aquatic city in reference to Tal Volantis formerly being an aquatic planet. Two million years ago, the alien inhabitants of Tal Volantis would come across something not known to them. However, we know it all too well. It was in fact a black marker the aliens would investigate the strange looking obelisk and not too long after they would make the same mistakes that the humans would make in the years to come. Figuring the marker could be used like a battery to give them near limitless power, they began replicating more of them instead of investigating any adverse effects it may have on their species. The aliens ignored any signs of caution and replicated dozens of red and blue markers in hopes of obtaining limitless energy to reach that bright future just out of their grasp. In their minds, the marker would give them the boost they needed for their ever-growing civilization. The aliens would begin to even worship the markers, just like how Unitology would do so as well. However, the markers would soon pull back the curtain and reveal their master plan. Sometime later, a violent outbreak had arisen from the depths of Tau Volantis that would spread over the entire planet, killing and reanimating the population into horrific and mutilated necromorphs. Once the majority of the planet had fallen to the Marker's will, the Markers themselves began to rise into the air, spreading across the planet in order to create the first convergence event on Tau Volantis. With the collective mind attempting to assimilate the fallen and infected into a brethren moon, the aliens sought a way to save their world before the game could end for them. Using their highly advanced resourcefulness, they had constructed a huge terraforming machine, and using this machine, the alien survivors had begun terraforming the planet, effectively flash freezing the entirety of their world, stalling convergence and halting the outbreak. However, their success may have saved their world, but came with a heavy price, that being their own extinction. Two million years later, the Sovereign Colonies had sent General Spencer Mahad and Admiral Marjorie Graves to find Tau Volantis, believing the signal that had plotted their course was leading them to the source of the Markers. Desperate and in the final years of the Succession Wars, they began to orbit the planet. The ships that they had taken were as follows, the CMS Terra Nova, the CMS Roanoke, the CMS Brozolov, and the CMS Greeley. Upon seeing Tau Volantis, Earl Serrano would spearhead the 
exploration to land on the planet's surface to find artifacts and resources to aid them in their current plight. As soon as they had landed, they could see the desolate wasteland being nothing but just ice and snow, the vast blue oceans now replaced by a sheet white environment. The fathomless gorges and trenches would now act as tall cliffs and mountains. The environment itself was harsh and very deadly, just like the Antarctic, or perhaps even worse than that. Rig suits would have to be worn in most areas for the best chance at survival against the harsh conditions. General Mahad would stand in protest to Admiral Graves, stating that the mission was a waste of time and resources, and that he and his forces would do better assisting back on Earth in the battlefields against the rebellion. Graves would ask Serrano to give General Mahad a presentation of the importance of the mission and how it would benefit their cause. Good afternoon, General. Admiral Graves asked me to prepare this information for you. <clears throat> When the Black Marker was exhumed on the Earth in 2214, it defied our understanding of science. It appeared to generate limitless energy, a trait of obvious importance in our resource-strapped times. There was an effort to replicate the Marker, hoping to understand its technology, thereby acquiring limitless energy for ourselves. Imagine our surprise when we learned they are not sources of energy, but receivers of it via carrier wave from somewhere deep in space. Triangulating this marker signal revealed a previously undetected planet, now known as Tau Volantis. We hope to find the source of this signal and finally harness the energy for ourselves. And if this works, it could mean a better future for all of us. General, thank you for your time. Sometime later, Graves would be upset in having to double bunk half the officers so Mahad could house his freeloading 163rd. Graves said that they are rude and they did not do a single useful thing aboard her vessel. Graves would ask why they are wasting resources on this frivolous addition to the mission. Mahad told Graves that if it was a bunk space that she was worried about, she would not have to worry for much longer. He was taking half of them down with him to the planet once they had managed to get themselves dug in. And they they are his insurance that nothing was going to go wrong. On the 29th of August 2311, an initial drop site had been established. The armed forces began to set up the planet and to build the necessary facilities needed for their researches. In the following weeks, the armed forces had set up a series of ground-based barracks, research facilities and drill sites under Mahad's authority. Tim Kaufman was a soldier within the Sovereign Colony's armed forces and was deployed at a SCAF colony on Tau Volantis. He would be assigned at an armory where he would work as an ammunition specialist. He would be responsible for the management of the ordnance in the armory. He would be tasked with receiving, storing and issuing conventional ammunition and explosives to task forces within the nearby colony bases. Sam Ackerman would also be assigned to the 41st Engineering Unit in support of the archaeological and research operations within the colony. Upon digging deeper into the icy crust of Tau Volantis, Serrano and his teams of researchers and dig crews would discover an alien city. They would soon begin excavating the area. Inside they would find frozen specimens of alien origin and several red markers found throughout the city, all varying in size. The science division began excavating the markers along with other artifacts and taking them back to the surface for study. Dr. Alexi would also take the specimens back to the surface to neurologically dissect them in an effort to better understand their physiology. Serrano and his team would pick up on the details about an alien machine that would be found atop the spire located at the heart of the city. Aided by the neurological data retrieved from the Rosetta and Nexus specimens, it was the source of the massive energy readings detected from the markers. Trying to determine how to use the machine, Serrano and his team created a codex, a device that would work in conjunction to the machine. While Serrano and his team worked on building the codex, the conditions at the armed forces facilities were slowly deteriorating. The members of the flotilla began to exhibit symptoms of market influence including headaches, lack of focus, hallucinations, and dementia. The bodies of the dead soldiers who experience the same symptoms are brought aboard the ships for safekeeping. Alongside the artifacts and markers, 
Serrano's dig team was affected by the marker in such a way that they adorned their snowsuits with marker symbols. Despite General Mahar's concerns, Admiral Graves ordered that the operation would proceed as expected. Sometime later, Graves was exposed to the artifacts brought up from the planet and stored on the ships. Gradually, her mind succumbed to the effects of the markers. She would be taken back to her quarters and be placed under quarantine. Mahad would then take complete control over the expedition. It was known throughout the expedition that General Mahad did not like El Serrano and would occasionally threaten him, stating that he is playing a dangerous game after the Admiral was placed under lock and key. In her isolation, Admiral Graves would start writing all over the walls what she had told General Mahad to do, which was to turn it off. Food supplies would start to dwindle at this time, and to make matters worse, a necromorph outbreak would occur. Not only did they have the cold to contend with, but the necromorphs had made the expedition into a battlefield. As rations had been finished off, many of the soldiers began to fall to the effects of starvation, and those immobilized corpses of the infected were starting to look pretty tasty. Devoid of caution, they would start to eat the necrotized flesh of these abominations of life, which would only add to their problems. Sam and his team would set up a defensive perimeter at a bunker known as Facility RS9, as they would be convinced that they could wait out the outbreak. It had gone to the point where Sam Ackerman's group had started consuming necromorph flesh. Sam knew it was not a good idea to do this and decided to stay away from them while they ate the tainted meat. Dr. Alexi's research on frozen alien samples recovered from Tau Volantis's ice packs involved using the corpses of infected armed forces soldiers who were killed after volunteering for the project to forward the specimens. On the 17th of June 2314, the Necromorph outbreak across the colony had become too much for Mahad and his forces to handle. The Sovereign Colonies Council issued a Scenario 5 kill order for all of the personnel on Tau Volantis. He ordered his remaining military personnel via broadcast to commence with a colony-wide quarantine, which included disabling all of the vehicles and ships in the colony and orbit, destroying all of the communication devices on the planet and in the orbiting vessels, destroying all of the data and files relating to the experiments and research that the science teams uncovered up to that point, and finally murdering any remaining personnel as well as to committing suicide following these completed tasks. If you are watching this film, it means despite our every precaution, containment has become a necessity. It is now up to us to make the ultimate sacrifice for the safety of the sovereign colonies that we have sworn to protect. We understand we cannot expect 100% compliance. Therefore, the military arm of this final quarantine campaign will divide into three tiers of soldiers on sweep and cleanse duty. The first crew disables all vehicles. The next takes census of the personnel who have obeyed the order and provides assistance to those who have not. The last destroys all data, records, and communication structures on Tau Volantis and in orbit. At the end of these tasks, each group will consider their mission objectives complete and proceed to self-terminate. God bless the sovereign colonies, and may he have mercy on us all. Private Tim Kaufman was unaware of this order. The next day when the commander of the colony, General Mahad, came to the armory to requisition all of the ammunition there for use in the kill order, Private Kaufman reported that the armory key was missing. This prompted General Mahad to threaten him with a permanent assignment of peeling potatoes unless that key was found quickly. At this time, Earl Serrano would keep on researching what the purpose of the machine was until some time later he finally cracked the case and that was the machine flash freeze the planet to prevent the completion of convergence and if they turn off the machine then convergence would resume a brethren moon would be formed however there would be a way to destroy the moon by configuring the machine with the codex sometime after this serrano would contact him and convince him to help him in a special mission Meanwhile, the soldiers inside of the facility RS-9 began to turn feral. Sam had barricaded himself in a communications room within the bunker. They would try to claw their way inside. When that would fail, though, they would attempt at using what little humanity they had left and began negotiating with Sam, asking him to let them in, to let them eat him. Sam! What is it? 
Sam Ackerman. Is anyone left out there? Sam, it's Dr. Serrano. Listen, you must make your way to Facility 1. Do you hear me? Trapped and fearing the worst, Sam would send out a distress beacon which Serrano would answer, telling him to meet up with a nearby soldier named Tim. As he leaves, he records a message to anyone that would play when the elevator becomes active. He would then seal the elevator, then link up with Tim outside where he would lead him to the mission to find the Codex, fading into the events of Dead Space Free's opening cutscene. Oh! Jesus, Kaufman! This is hopeless! Alpha Niner, this is Whiskey 250. Alpha Niner, this is Whiskey 250. Serrano, do you read me? Tim! Oh, thank God! Did you find it? Find it. Doc, I'm not even sure what we're looking for. Just uh, follow the waypoint to thank you. I, I can't tell you anymore. Just get there. Don't, do you hear me? You have to get there. What? Oh, oh, it's long. What? Dang it! Follow the waypoint. We've been following it for three hours and ain't found squat. Their mission would lead them to a ship crashed on the side of a cliff. Fighting their way through the infected crew of the ship, they would soon reach the cockpit where they would find the Codex. Tim and Sam would escape the wreckage by rappelling down a cliffside. As the ship had started to give away, it would soon follow Sam and Tim's path. Tim would escape from the wreck. Unfortunately, the debris from the ship would kill Sam. Tim would then meet the General one last time. Fine young soldiers, every one of them. General Mahad, sir. Where's Dr. Serrano? Earl Serrano, always the optimist. Well, he said I should take this into the city. He said there's still time to stop it, sir. There's still time. We lost control. And now for the love of Earth and the sovereign colonies, we've got to do what's right. You love the Earth, son, your mom, and dad. Yeah, yes, sir, of course. Good. Glad to hear that. Earl Serrano would later succumb to his wounded knee, detailing in a log that he busted his knee open and possibly died due to starvation, dehydration, or maybe even exposure to the cold. Most likely though, he would have died due to gangrene. He would pass away inside the chamber, leading towards the alien machine at the base of the spire, at the center of the city. Thanks to the actions of the SCAF division of the Sovereign Colonies, this sacrifice would stall convergence before it even began. Unfortunately, the Markers would always find ways through the cracks, and soon would succeed in their mission to become whole.
200 years later in 2514, scared marker research left behind by the sovereign colonies would be rediscovered by Damara Carver, which would lead her into finding the coordinates for the forsaken planet of Tau Volantis. Damara collected enough information regarding the markers and what she believed to be the marker homeworld for Robert Norton, captain of one of the last few remaining pockets of EarthGov, and Ellie Langford, one of the two that survived the Titan Station outbreak. Unfortunately, before they could meet, Danik, the leader of the Church of the Unitology subfaction, the Circle, had gone to her first and killed her, along with John Carver's son, Dylan. In Ellie's efforts to reach Tau Volantis via a shock ring, she would tell Robert and John to find the survivor of both the Aegis 7 and Titan Station incidents, Isaac Clark. While John and Robert would be trying to find Isaac among the lunar colony on the moon overlooking Earth, Ellie and her team would arrive at Tau Volantis. However, shortly after their arrival, they would meet the defences erected by General Mahad's forces, mines that would follow heat signatures in the cold vacuum of space. Closing in and detonating on the hull, the crew abandoned the ship and made for the USM Roanoke, where they would discover that they were not alone. Battered and bruised, they could take no chances, and decided to find a safe haven within the ship, sneaking past the dormant necromorphs where they would spend the next 13 days alone in the dank, dark, dusty old tomb that was once Admiral Graves' vessel. As they had found their safe haven living with the quiet infestation, Carver and Norton would search for any signs of Isaac, quickly learning that they were not the only ones looking for him. As the church had deployed Danik and his teams to eliminate what they call the Marker Killer for heresy against unitology and the next stage in human evolution. Carver and Norton would soon find Isaac at his apartment while trying to convince him to help them in their quest to save Ellie. The Sergal had arrived, blowing through the perimeter that Robert had established earlier. They would fight through both necromorphs and unitologist fanatics to escape, and as soon as Isaac was secured, they shot pointed out to Ellie's coordinates aboard the Eudora. As Ellie had been caught off by the mines, so would the Eudora, becoming swarmed by them with explosions going off all over the ship. Isaac soon took control of the situation and instructed Robert, John and the crew so they could all get out of the disaster alive. Some of that paneling and seal up that doorway. Since when are you giving the orders? Since nobody else has a fucking plan. Look, I'll explain as I go. Carver, where can I find an EVA suit? Good. Down that way! As the ship gave one last explosion, it would send Isaac, John, Robert, Rosen and Locke hurtling approximately 100 miles per hour through space, then coming slowly to a stop next to the Roanoke. As Isaac had entered the ship, the air filtration systems had oddly activated, pressurizing the room so he may breathe like the ship was still functional after being inactive and adrift for over 200 years. The air had a foul sting to it, the rooms were filled with dust and the doors upon opening them had a loud creak that would echo throughout the corridors. Isaac and John would split up from the rest of the crew. They would begin talking about the coffins and bloodstains on the walls, theorizing that it could have been executions as they make their way towards the signal until they meet some old friends. Hey guys, we're in trouble. What is it? What's going on? I just got jumped by what's left of the crew. What? No one could have survived out here that long. They didn't survive. They got turned into those things. What? Okay. What do we do? You keep your weapon ready and you stay the hell away from the ventilation ducts. If they get close, shoot for the lips. You got that? I said you got that! Yeah, yeah, okay, okay.
As Isaac and John would battle it out against new and old variations of necromorphs, Robert, Locke and Rosen would be fighting the necromorphs holding their ground, building barricades to hold them at bay, even placing debris over the vents to keep them out. Once power had been restored by Isaac and Carver's doing, the necromorphs would retreat back into the vents, allowing Norton to meet Isaac and Carver at the signal location where they would reunite with Ellie, Buckle and Santos. You found us. Oh, Ellie, baby. <laughs> mm. I knew you were too stubborn to die. <laughs> Captain, is this him? Oh, uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's him. I say, Clark, great to meet you. Austin Buckle, marker ops. Uh, this here is Jennifer Santos, our little lady with the big brain. If it's true you can decipher the marker script, this mission might still have a chance. Isaac, thank you for coming. Like I had a choice. I know, I'm sorry. But I have so much to tell you. Oh, Mario, come on, we have to get, get out of here now. No, not yet. Isaac, we need to stop the marker. The trail ends at the Admiral's quarters. She'd written marker scroll all over the walls. The answers are in there, I know it. We cannot leave until we know what it says. Yeah, well then let Isaac handle the translating. We're leaving now. I got Buckle, you get Santos, let's go. Oh. Go on, take care of your crew. They need you more than I do. You could have warned me about Ellie and the captain. No one cares about your love life, Marker boy. Isaac and John would fight their way back the way they came, finding the Admiral's quarters where Isaac would decipher the scribbles on the wall. Isaac, hey, turn it off. hey, what is it? What's going on? Nothing, nothing. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Oh, Ellie, the Admiral was obsessed with making a key. A key to what? Hey, a key to what? Some sort of alien device. A machine. I think that she believed that it controlled the markers. Oh my god. She wanted to turn it off. She wrote that over and over again like a mantra. Or instructions. This is exactly what we've been looking for. This isn't just some random planet, Isaac. They found the source. The Marker Homeworld. You have got to be shitting me. Marker Homeworld. All right, let's regroup in the control room. We can plan our next move from there. Clark, shake it off, let's go! Clark! The team had stated that if they were going to get out of this alive, they needed a ship where Buckle would find a scrapped transport ship called the CMS Crozier within the records for the Love Boat as it was nicknamed by those who worked on it. Its official name would be the CMS Terra Nova. As the two would shrug off Robert Norton's transmission about being with him or on Ellie's side, John starts to hallucinate his son calling out to him over an open frequency coming from the CMS Brusilov. The two decided to investigate the ship after restoring the life support, the two would find a marker surrounded by the dead. Isaac tries to stop John, but as John picks up a giant toy soldier, they are suddenly ambushed by necromorphs. After escaping the ship, Isaac asks him what he had saw, with Carver avoiding the question. After Isaac and John had salvaged the shuttle and collected the parts to reconfigure it for the journey to the planet's surface, they would begin preparations for their departures, much to Robert and Rosen's disdain. Well, I'm glad to see you, too. What's that look for? This is going to work, right? Our window's coming up. We go now or not at all. Hey, what's up with the oxygen injectors? How come they're not locked down? I tried, but the threads are rusty. Well, let me see what I can do. If one of those pops loose, the cabin fire is going to burn us up before the atmosphere does. 
Do me a favor. Find the pressure reading on the main console and let me know when I have a solid seal. <sighs> this is suicide. Those mines will rip this ship apart. It'll hold. Okay, everyone. Let's see if this thing can fly. Fuel lines are go. Sensors online. I'm seeing mines at 2,000 meters. Targeting computers spinning up. Okay, Isaac. You have the controls. Projecting optimal route now. Try to keep it on course and shoot anything that gets in the way. Thrusters, one quarter forward. Correction. We can't correct now. We'll miss our window. At this angle, we won't reach the window. Okay, I'm sending you a new vector. <clears throat> Norton would wake up first, and in his desperation made an unlikely choice in contacting Danik for help, giving him all the information he needed to find them, along with making a deal he could have Isaac in exchange for safe passage back to civilization. In Norton's eyes, the man who destroyed the organization he served for quite some time, his enemy was now his only hope in saving his dearly beloved Ellie. As Ellie, Santos and Bucker would come too, they would find that they are in freezing temperatures. Ellie stands in protest, stating that they should wait for Isaac and John. But after seeing her crew's fate dwindling in the sharpness of the air, she decided to record a video for Isaac and John in case they had came this way, and to light flares in the direction that they were going. Isaac, if you find this... God, I Ellie, come I on! We're freezing to death out here! I'm coming! We're on our way to find some shelter. But I'm gonna leave you this trail of flares. If the man's dead, Ellie, let's go! Isaac, please, be alive! Come on! <laughs> They would soon find shelter from the cold, finding gear that would aid them in their survival, keeping the cold at bay. However, there are only three snowsuits for the four survivors. 
As Norton was to find a way to power up the nearby elevator, they began to hear scratching and other noises coming from below, which frightened them enough to keep their distance. This in turn prompted Buckle to stay behind, as the cold was just too much for him. At this time, Isaac and John would be coming back to the grim reality that was that they were alone in the bitter cold wilderness. The crash hadn't just separated the two parties, it had also crippled their suits. Using the fires of the crash to keep themselves warm along their journey, they would soon encounter a huge necromorph that would begin following them like a hunter stalking its prey. Isaac and John would soon find Buckle where he would soon succumb to the cold and dying of hypothermia. Buckle. Isaac. <laughs> well, I'll be dead. Where is everyone? They're headed for a research facility up the ridge. <laughs> We found snowsuits, but there weren't enough to go around, so I decided to stay behind. There might be more down in the basement. <laughs> might be. Uh, the elevator shot, and we heard something scratching around down there. Choosing to ignore the warning, the two ventured into the basement to find suits, where they would find out what happens if you eat the infected firsthand. You think Norton was right about not coming to this place? Buckle knew the risk he died for the mission, and he won't be the last. Yeah, well, don't get too choked up over it. I won't. And you better not lose it over some girl. Everyone's expendable. No, you see, I'm not that broken. Ellie's worth more to me than this mission. And what are you gonna do when she's a corpse on the floor, huh? What are you gonna do when everything you care about is gone? You tell me. You fucking lost, Clark. Yeah. I'm the one that's lost. Shit! Where'd it go? Shh. Mouth shut. Eyes open. At this time, Santos, Ellie, and Norton would be leaving a cave which would lead them to the research facility when they are suddenly under attack from a pack of necromorphs. Fighting their way past them, they would soon come to an icy clearing just outside of the facility. Norton and Ellie would hold them off, leaving Santos to jumpstart the cargo lift allowing them to escape the parodies of humanity for a short period of time. Meanwhile, John and Isaac would be making their way to the research facility, encountering the stragglers from Ellie and Norton's counter-attack. Pushing past them, they would slowly make it through the cliffside towards the clearing and to the facility that they would regain contact with Ellie, Norton and Santos. Ellie! Keep it down! As long as we're on this side of that wall, we're sitting ducks. She's in there. Well, we're not getting in through the front door. Hey, what? Let's get one thing straight, Clark. We came to this frozen shithole to stop the markers, and nothing, not you or your obsession with Ellie, is going to get in my way. You got that? I know I'm doing this to you. Let's get this lift powered up. With any luck, everyone will be waiting for us past the gates. I think I see a way over the gate. With their victory against their stalking adversary, they go to meet the others. Isaac. Isaac, you made it. Thank God. I knew you'd catch up. 
Good to see you made it, Isaac. You know, maybe we should give you two some time alone, huh? What the hell does that mean? It means for someone who's in the past, you're awfully glad to see him. We need him. This mission needs Come on, him. We need him or you need him. Hey, you got something to say to me, Captain? Stop. Just stop. We need to shut down that damn machine and we don't even know where it is yet. I do. I, I mean, I think I know how to find it. Well, I've been digging through what's left of the research notes and- I thought all that stuff was destroyed. Well, computer data, yes. But the written logs discuss a signal tracking experiment that pinpointed the machine's exact location. Well, I think if we repeat it, we can do the same. But it's at the other end of the complex. Yeah, fine. Fine, let's have a look. I could use a change of scenery. He's a real asshole. You know that? As they leave to find the warehouse, they are suddenly bombarded with Isaac and Carver falling to the ground below to find out that the Unitologists had followed them and were intent on claiming their prize. Everybody move! <laughs> How the hell did Danik's men find us? Come on! Come on! Run! Ali! Go! We'll meet up at the warehouse! After losing their pursuers to the Necromorphs, Santo sends Carver and Isaac to locate parts of a sensor so they may use a Necromorph known as a Nexus to locate a signal that would lead them to the machine that Admiral Graves had mentioned in her notes. Looks like they modified a telemetry spike. I have no idea how it works, but yeah, I think I can build it with the right parts. Where's the other warehouse? I'll put the coordinates in your rig. It is most likely to be locked down tight. Here. I found these research passcodes when we arrived. They got us into this warehouse. Maybe they will work for the other buildings as well. Well, we'll find out. Back soon. As they leave the area, Carver sees a woman shaking, crying, and bloodied in the cold, moving back the way they had previously come from. Isaac follows Carver to make sure he is okay, as he didn't or couldn't see what Carver did. Heading inside the archaeology warehouse, the elevator had broken down where Carver would hallucinate something truly horrifying, while Isaac would be standing there, powerless to help his ally. Sounds like it's jammed. What now? Huh? What's the... No. Isaac, are you seeing this? You see what we want to, John. What? Wait, what are you what are you talking about? What? Isaac! Isaac! In their travels, tin soldiers would line the walls, all varying in size. The further they went, the more the voices of Dylan and Damara would haunt Carver. Upon reaching the end of the line, Carver would black out, with him coming too, still inside the elevator with Isaac stating that they have been sitting there for five minutes, implying that the events within the mission, or the warehouse, never happened, and was all within his mind. This elevator for five minutes. Now, are we gonna check this place out or not? No, let's go. Sure. I guess some things are better left buried, right, Carl? With a shook and carver, they find the parts they need and leave to get back to the others when their number one fan returns for round two. running away before I can kill it. Oh, God, 
We can't seem to catch a break. Well, if the sensor works, we will have the machine's location. If this planet doesn't kill us first. We'll find it. I'll be back soon. As soon as they had constructed the probe, they pried open the chest of the behemoth, and Norton, to his disgust, helps Isaac and Carver into the belly of the beast. As they succeed fighting off the last of the defense mechanisms, Carver and Isaac headed back to the cage, while Ellie and Santos would gather the necessary tools for the journey up the mountain and to the Rosetta Labs. Norton would soon trap Isaac and Carver in the cage, jamming their comms so they wouldn't be able to call for help. Norton, open the cage. No. What? If you want to die here, now's your chance. I'm taking control of this mission again. Hey, where are you going? Saving Ellie. Norton! 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 As they were attempting to escape from their predicament, Norton would run into Danik, and soon Isaac and Carver would catch up to them, where all would be revealed to them of how the Circle had followed them through shock space and how they had found them at Tal Valantis. I wouldn't believe the trouble you saved me. Nice work. What? Well, here he is. The marker killer, Isaac Clark. And here we are. The marker homeworld. You know, I must admit, I almost didn't believe such a place existed. But thanks to your friend, Norton, I finally found it. That's how they followed us through shock space. Well, Oh, he is a bright one. All he wants is Isaac. Carver, the rest of us can go home. Deluded son of a bitch. You've got me. Let the others go. It's a very difficult thing, you know, undoing the damage man has done. Everything we touch, we contaminate, we corrupt. The Markers had a plan for us, but we took what should have been a magnificent gift and perverted it. Jesus, spare us the bullshit. <laughs> I've spent an entire lifetime trying to undo the damage man has done. Fighting EarthGov's ongoing research, liberating the markers from those profane testing facilities. And now, I just have one problem left to purge. All of you. No, 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 no. No, you promised me a ship, Danik. We had a deal. Yes, I'm sorry about that. But I can't afford to leave even one of you left alive. Apologies for misleading you, Captain. <laughs> As Isaac, Carver and Norton would be fighting the Unitologists, the Nexus had woken up, rather hungry and decided on joining the battle for a light meal of Unitologists. Despite their best efforts, Isaac and Carver would be sucked up and devoured by the Nexus, swallowing them whole. Come on! You fucking kidding me?
come down here. You encourage her. Now look where we are. Between Danny shooting at us and whatever the fuck that was, what chance have we got? You betrayed no, us! I tried to save us. You are the real problem here, Clark, but not anymore. Captain! Stay down, Sergeant! This is all your fucking fault. She doesn't love you! Fuck. Come on. He won't stay dead forever, not around here. What am I gonna tell Ellie? Hey. You tell her the truth. Now let's go. Isaac. Where's Robert? Is he... I shot him, Ellie. What? I'm sorry. I had no choice. Norton betrayed us, Ellie. He was ready to kill us. Isaac did what he had to do to save the mission. I... Oh, come on! We gotta keep moving. <laughs> now there are only four of us left. I can't do this! Then we leave you behind. If you can't keep your head, you're a danger to everybody. You're horrible! Nobody's leaving anybody. Now, oh, come on. Let's get to the top of this mountain. Together. Together. While Isaac and Carver are making their way up the mountains, Ellie would contact Isaac, letting out her mixed array of emotions in her grief for Norton's death. After this, Ellie and Santos would be attacked by necromorphs while waiting on Isaac and Carver to find a safe way for them to make their way up the mountains. Guys, I found a cargo cage, but it's wedged into the cliff. I'll try to free it and send it down. Ellie, can you hear me? We see it. Come on, Ellie. As the snow beast was attacking Santos, Isaac reaches over to her. In fear of the beast bringing the cliffs down on them, Carver grabs an axe and gives in to the necessary evil and sacrifices Santos in an attempt to safeguard the others. See, that wasn't so bad. Not bad. I was crying the whole way. Just get me some solid ground under my- <laughs> Take us all down with it. Isaac, the cliff's falling apart. Come on, damn it, give me your hand. I promised her. I could have reached her, but just had another second. While Isaac was ripping the beast in two, defeating it for the last time, Carver and Ellie would be making their way over to him. They would then call him over to a cliffside. As Isaac reaches the top of the cliff, he would reunite with Ellie and Carver, and he would share a moment with her. They would then make their way to the Rosetta Labs. While these events were going on, the Unitologists had regrouped and were coming after them. As Isaac and Carver had found Ellie, they had found Rosetta, or at least what's left of her. Finally. And this is an assembly station, according to the controls. So we're here to assemble a codex. That makes sense. Uh, no. According to this, we're here to assemble Rosetta. They cut her into pieces? 
Oh my god. Fuck this day. They sliced her up. Why? I don't know. But some of the piece is already in the assembly. I think I see another piece over there. So, according to the records, there are four more pieces. They were checked out of storage by Dr. Serrano. Well, there are three buildings in the facility, so if there are more pieces, they're either in one or all of them. Most of the doors were locked down from what I could see. Yeah, well, you're in luck. Look what I found, a security pass. You want to give it a shot? Hey, why not? Great, thanks. Find out what you can about how assembling Rosetta will create a codex. I'll explore the labs and recover the rest of the Rosetta slabs. On their mission to find Rosetta, Kava begins to hallucinate again, having some face time with his deceased wife imposed over Isaac's helmet. Kava and Isaac would take a look inside of a warehouse where Kava would be transported within his demented mind into a plane of birthday presents with jagged rocks and pictures of his family. <laughs> When are you coming home? Do it. She wants me to, to join them or well, whatever you're seeing, it's not real, man, okay? You gotta trust me here. You want me? Ah! I'm right here tomorrow, come on! We stop the markers. The only reason I'm still alive is so I can make my shitty life mean something. Come on, let's just get out of here. After Isaac and Carver had found the rest of Rosetta, they activated the device to create the codex for the machine. As they did, Isaac would be granted a vision of what truly happened on the planet. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, here she is. Meet Rosetta. Where's her face? She doesn't have a face. It's not even a she. It's an it. Rosetta's an alien. What? What does that mean? It means they used an alien brain to unlock the secrets of the alien machine. It's clever. All right, let's see what happens when we activate it. This could get a little weird. Fingers crossed. We've got it all wrong. This isn't the marker homeworld. The aliens, they, they found the markers just like us and it spread. It consumed them. It, it pulled their bodies into the sky to form the final stage. Oh my god, the The moon is the source of the marker signal, not the machine. The moon is convergence. The aliens, they... They built the machine to freeze the planet. To keep the moon from becoming whole. If the machine shuts down, everything thaws. And convergence has resumed, not just here, but... Everywhere the markers have spread. And this is... Is the key. I'm turning it all off. Thank you for doing all the heavy lifting. No! It will home in on Earth's markers and hunt us down. You don't understand oh, what you're doing. I misunderstood doing. initially. That's true, but it's all quite clear to me now. It's not only mankind's tampering which has hindered our glorious rebirth, but this alien machine as well. Stay away from that machine, Danik. No. And now that I have this, I'll be able to turn it off. The natives of this planet chose death over evolution. Now I'll make sure humanity doesn't make the same mistake. We will all of us be made whole. Well, come on, kill them. Malfunction. We gotta shut this door. Oh Ellie, come on! Ellie! It's no good. It's moving too fast. Isaac, do it. Just do it. Isaac! I love you. No. Isaac! Hey! That cat is still coming! We gotta go! Now! She's all I got. This was her mission. She knew better than anyone how important it was. Now we've gotta finish this for her! Got it? Do you got it? Yeah. Then let's go! Isaac, now! 
I left her. Ellie. Isaac. Hey. Keep it together. Come on, man. Don't fall apart on me. Look, Danik is headed down to that machine. We can't let him shut it down. Then we're gonna make sure he never gets there. Right. Got that? All right. But how do we find him? The entrance could be anywhere. Santos. She said the machine was directly below this facility. We sent our locators to that point, and it'll take us straight to Danik. Isaac and Carver would chase Danik all the way down to the alien city where they would find out how to properly configure the machine to destroy the moon. While they were chasing Danik and his forces, Ellie had escaped the burning gases by climbing up the extraction tube where the Rosetta slabs had arrived from, where she would be found by the unitologist with some burns and skulls from the gas, wearing a tank top probably having to remove her coat to be able to fit through the air ducts. Isaac and Carver would come across El Serrano's notes and logs where they would find out about the Brethren Moons and its brothers and what would happen if they fail. After this they would encounter Danik where Isaac would explode a wall which collapsed the floor allowing them to escape with the codex in hand. <laughs> As Isaac and Carver would reconfigure the machine, they discovered the city itself was the machine, and they would also discover discs on the floor that would empower their kinesis and stasis abilities, but with a cost of endurance. As Isaac and Carver would finish reconfiguring the machine, they would be contacted by Danik where he desperately begs Isaac to allow him to turn off the machine. He would then contact Isaac again, revealing Ellie's fate, stating that they will be waiting for them at the top of the spire. Turn off the machine. My reinforcement have arrived with a big surprise. Going? I said! You're alive! How is it? I escaped through the delivery tube, but they caught me. I think they're gonna call you up in the. Ah! Let go of me! Shut up, heretic! Ah! Ah! I have the codex, Danik. If you want it, you have to find me. Huh? No, I won't. You're heading to the machine. And when you get there, I'll be waiting. Ellen! Isaac, don't do it. Don't listen to him. Give me the codex and you can have her back. No! Isaac, you know what's at stake. Okay, everybody calm down, okay? Danik, give me the codex or I will kill her! No! Isaac, what are you doing? You, you got a second chance. If he turns off the machine, we're all dead. Her? Us? Everyone. Don't let it all go dark, Isaac. There's more than one kind of right. No! Begin. 
after this, Ellie would get into a Unitologist shuttle and move away from Tal Volantis and into space to watch the battle from a safer distance. As convergence resumes, the world itself seems to be disintegrating. Isaac and John would move fast, fighting their way to the machine where their suits would become damaged as a door explodes. Isaac and Carver would witness the moon holding the machine, showing it using great caution towards its great power. Isaac and Kaiba would see the machine become swallowed by the moon in a last ditch effort to stop itself from being frozen again. They would use the disc to grab it and pull the machine through the guts of the blood moon. As the battle had concluded, Ellie attempted to hail Isaac and Kaiba to hear only static play back to her. Believing that Isaac and Kaiba were no more, she shot points out to an unknown location, perhaps Earth. So this is it, huh? We we'll use that codex. Yeah. No more bullshit. We die here now. But Earth gets to tomorrow. <laughs> Isaac? Isaac? Are you there? Kava? Isaac? You're gone, aren't you? The Mark Sigma. It's gone too. Isaac, you did it. You really did it. Earth space coordinates confirmed. Shock drive enabled. Standing by. Unitologist fanatic only known as the Prophet would hear a voice after the battle stating that they are coming and they are hungry. He would soon start preaching to other Unitologists these cryptic messages with some choosing to follow him, seeing him as the one true Prophet. Randall Carr, one of Danik's men would recall the fanatics back to the shuttles where they would soon flee to the Terra Nova. Sometime after this, Carver and Isaac would soon wake up inside of a cave. Remarkably, they don't seem to be hurt, despite falling to what seems to be their death. Nevertheless, they decide to climb the ice wall and see what will be waiting for them outside. <laughs> What the fuck you doing, man? 
Barbara. What are you doing in my apartment? We're not in your apartment. We're not supposed to be anywhere. Aren't we dead? That doesn't make any sense. Isaac, you activated the Codex. The moon fell. We fell. What about the alien machine? It froze the planet. It pulled a moon out of the sky. We don't know what that technology can do. So that's it? We were saved by fucking aliens? I quit trying to make sense of it all back on the Ishimura. Come on! This, this can't be real! Wait, what are we supposed to do now? Well, for starters, get the hell out of here. And go where? Back to Earth? Yeah. If we're dead, we can do what we want, right? Right. So we did kill the moon. There it is. Why is it way over there? Its orbit must have carried it westward as it was pulled down by the machine. I still don't understand how we survived. Maybe we didn't. Well, I'd know if I was dead, man. Man, I don't even know what dead means anymore. Are we Necomorphs? Is this what they feel like after the... after the marker reanimates them? Could you be any more crazy? Hell no, we are not Necromorphs. We killed the thing that makes them. At least we don't have to put up with that shit anymore. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. No more moon. No more marker signal. No more Necromorphs. At least that's on our side. Yeah. Now we're just stuck on this godforsaken planet. Danik had a strong contingent down here hunting us. One of their ships has to be around here. Now that's a good idea. Let's get looking, dead boy. That's not funny. Yeah, it is. After this, Isaac and Kappa would be looking for a unitologist shuttle when this would happen. <laughs> Carver, did you just see some weird shit? Yeah. yeah. But how's that possible? Who knows? Hey, don't freak out. With the birth and death of the Blood Moon or Brethren Moon, Isaac and Carver see unitologists all over the nearby research facilities losing their minds, or at least what's left of them. Some would commit suicide while others would be mumbling to themselves while in a fetal position, regretting their past choices as now they have seen what unitology's message of unity and rebirth really entails, destroying their undying loyalty. At this time, the unitologists that went to the Terra Nova had started acting even more insane than normally, choosing to follow the man that was known as the Prophet, one that would preach about a new order, a church not of brick and mortar, but of flesh and blood. Isaac and Carver would see more hallucinations and shortly would see Norton just standing in the middle of an area. Upon further inspection, Norton transforms into a deadly necromorph, poised to kill the two for their mutiny, but this time, he would not be alone. Good. No. You're dead! Hey! Hey, Nord! Unitologists aboard the Terra Nova would begin to ritualistically mutilate themselves, soaring off body parts as offerings to the approaching moons, worshipping the necromorphs instead of the markers. Carr and a small number of his team would attempt to hide from them, but one by one, they would either kill themselves or be captured by the cultists, and forcibly be converted to their new cause. After killing Norton for the second time, even though it was a hallucination and not the real deal, Isaac and Carver would fight 
real necromorphs, with the knowledge that the nightmare is not over just yet. They figure that the moon they killed must have contacted the others and that they need to escape Tal Volantis and get back to Earth before it's too late. As the two get to a shuttle, Isaac regretfully informs Carver that the shock point drive isn't working, so they will need to find something up there to play around with instead. Here, it's just a little... Oh no. Oh no what? Uh, the shock drive on this thing is out. It's only got impulse. So we're stuck. <sighs> Just stuck on this star system. We can make it as far as the flotilla. We'll just have to find something up there to play with. We'll make it home. Don't worry. Worry? I don't know if I'm dead or alive. What's the worry? transponders. It's coming from the cradle. What happened to the other ships? One up in the minefield, I guess. Come on, let's take a look. Meanwhile, Carr would be captured after his leg was broken, and though he was able to resist their madness, he wrote one final journal entry in which he would comment that he had lost all of his beliefs in the Unitologist religion, and he now hoped that, after the cultists had killed him, he would experience oblivion. Meanwhile, as Isaac and Carver moved through the ship, they would be besieged by screams of agony and cries for help in the distance, echoed by the claustrophobic hallways and corridors inside the Terra Nova. They would eventually come across a gathering to an unknown cult that strangely enough looked like the Necromorphs, like they had been restored back to their somewhat original forms but with a twist. The former Unitologists would attack Isaac and Carver not with guns but with blades dressed like the Necromorphs attacking in the same way as if they idolised them. Isaac would soon come up to the shock point drive as he is about to touch it he suddenly blacks out, being transported to a realm overlooking Earth, with the Brethren Moons overlooking the realm he stands in within his own mind. They ask Isaac about Earth and its location, and given him the idea that he would be leading them straight towards Earth's location, prompting him to tell Carver his recalculation of the plan. Show us the way to Earth, Isaac. We're not going back. Yes, we are. If any one of us returns, they're gonna follow. We have to destroy the shock point drive. Like hell, we're marching down to the reactor right now so we can install this thing. We're taking it to the reactor, all right? And then we're gonna throw it in and destroy this ship. No one goes to Earth, Carver. No one. Huh. Yeah, we'll see about that. While these events were playing out, the moons were already on their way to Earth and were playing Isaac and Carver against one another, giving them time to add another brother to their collection. The reactor should be right up here. Now when we get there... You're wrong, Carver. Going home is just what they want us to do. Oh, would you stop and listen to yourself, man? You're a fucking lunatic! You're not setting foot in this engine room. Only one of us is getting out of this room alive. It is gonna be your funeral, man!
Meanwhile, the moons would be getting closer to Earth, moving past the outskirts of the system. Isaac would install the shock point into the core and vent the radiation while Carver would prep the bridge, and soon they would make their way back to Earth space. Let's go! Let's go! We may just blow up. We may just get saved by aliens again. Just hit the damn button! As Isaac and Carver exit the shock space, they attempt to make contact with Earth, only getting static and garbled up noises in return to their requests. However, those noises soon turned into screams as they then saw that they were too late. The moons had gotten there first. <laughs> Earth Orbital Control, this is Isaac Clark aboard the CMS Terra Nova requesting clearance over. Are you sure you got the right channel? This is over 200 years old. Yeah, no, I changed it over, right? Trust me. Trust me, it's right. EarthGov Command, this is Sergeant John Carver. Do you read me? Is anyone there? It's weird. United Mining Traffic Flow, do you copy? Lunar Flight Control, this is CMS Terra Nova. Does anyone read us out here? of Isaac, Ellie, Carver and other characters are currently unknown. Following the fall of Earth and the lunar colonies, humanity was truly within the end of days, with only scattered cells remaining throughout the galaxy becoming even more like the necromorphs who set them on this path, scavenging for resources, food, materials for their ships, in hopes one day the human race can band together and defeat the brethren moons once and for all. Thank you all so much for watching the video and thank you all once again for helping me in reaching my goal for this year of 1000 subscribers. You are all in my opinion an amazing group of people along with the older subscribers who have supported this channel for quite some time now. You are all in my opinion the best audience I could have asked for. I honestly cannot believe how many of you have actually subscribed to me and are supporting this channel and I will be making a video to celebrate achieving that milestone which will either be a timeline on my journey through YouTube from the earliest years all the way to now or maybe I will do a Q&A video where you guys can ask me questions about myself, the channel, something you would like to know about future content, something about the making of such videos, something revolving around that maybe. And to be honest everyone, I cannot decide as those are two very good ideas so I'll let you all decide of which of the two I will be doing for my celebration video of 1000 subscribers. So comment your submission down below in the comment section. If you comment the Q&A be sure to add a question for me to pull up in the video. Whichever loses will be the reward for the next milestone. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video then give the video a like rating, comment me something to read later on and I look forward to hearing from you. And if you're new here then sign up to join the British Alliance today by subscribing and ringing in the notification bell to be notified of future updates and videos straight away and I will see all of you on the front lines and have a good one.